So if you're wondering why you need to secure your cactus watering system at home, Ed Nightingale from the Azure Sphere team joins me on the IIT show today to tell us everything about the security promise of Azure Sphere. Hi everyone, this is the Internet of Things show. I'm Olivier, your host, and today with Ed, we'll talk about the Azure Sphere Security Promise. Ed, thanks for joining us on the show today. Hey, I'm happy to be back. It's good to be here. Yeah, you're back, but not everyone actually knows you. So how about you introduce yourself and you tell us what you're doing at Microsoft? Absolutely. Uh, my name is Ed Nightingale. I'm the Director of Engineering for Azure Sphere. Uh, I've been with the product basically since its inception, and I'm here to talk about the Azure Sphere security promise and a little bit more about how Azure Sphere differentiates when we talk about defense in depth and Azure and security with IoT. Awesome. So Azure Sphere is now generally available, right? So that's a recent yes. announcement that's been made. Uh, it's one of the reasons you're here on the show. Uh, and, and our audience really have heard about Azure Sphere, but from you, what we'd like to dig into is why should they care? So securing IoT devices is important, but you know, let's discuss more about why. Why do you need to secure devices? So here's the so the deck I brought with me. I wanted to just start by going back and talking about what is Azure Sphere. Um, Azure Sphere is a end-to-end -end solution for securing IoT devices, and Azure Sphere is really composed of four pillars. There are Azure Sphere certified chips. These are chips certified by Microsoft to meet Azure Sphere's high bar in terms of silicon security. There is the Azure Sphere operating system. This is a purpose-built operating system for IoT with new defense and depth features to help protect your IoT device. There's the Azure Sphere security service that runs in the cloud that uh, guards every Azure Sphere device in terms of authentication, attestation, update and error reporting. And then there's Azure Sphere servicing, which is our promise from Microsoft to provide ongoing updates from Microsoft to provide, to provide updates in a rapidly evolving threat environment to make sure your device isn't just secure the day you buy it, but it stays secured for the lifetime of the device. And so this is our promise and our guarantee. And as you mentioned, the big news for us is that Azure Sphere has announced general availability in February. And what this means is that Azure Sphere now meets Microsoft's high bar for quality, scalability, privacy, and security. Azure Sphere is open for business, we're ready for customers, and we're ready for scale. And this is a this is a huge milestone for any product at Microsoft to move from an incubation or a product in private preview to a product that's really available for anyone to use. And so we're really excited about that. Before you jump into some details about, you know, the seven properties and defense and death, um, something that I want to point out to our audience is that when we say GA and ready for customers, um, think of it as, you know, we are leveraging Microsoft decades of experience in securing uh, IT and PCs and laptops and servers and infrastructures and our customer solutions into you know, securing IoT devices uh, through Azure Sphere, right? So this is, I think, mm -hmm. something that's very important for our audience here. Thank you. That's, that's one of the big benefits about working at Microsoft and bringing a new business uh, uh, and opening one up at Microsoft is that we have this huge amount of expertise across the company, and we get to leverage all of that when we bring our product to market. It it's, um, gives us an edge, quite frankly, against our competitors. It's fantastic. Yeah, totally. So tell me a bit more about, you know, what are these various, you know, areas that Azure Sphere helps secure? Why, you know, how do we secure an IoT device? Yeah, thanks for asking. When we talk about Azure Sphere, we talk about something called the seven properties of highly secure devices. This is actually a, a white paper that was published uh, in summer of 2017 that I helped author. And at that time, so was Microsoft putting a marker out there and said, look, IoT connected devices are coming and the security isn't good enough. And we feel that any device that connects to the internet needs to have as a minimum these seven properties. Now these seven properties, we didn't invent them. Some of them will be familiar to you if you're watching this video, but they're all required. And these properties run from things that belong in silicon, like a hard root of trust, which guarantees the integrity and uh, identity of your hardware to uh, things like a small trusted computing base, which means that you try to have as little code as possible running in the most trusted area to minimize its attack surface to hackers. 
We have things like certificate-based authentication, which is a best practice to ensure that you can authenticate the endpoint you're talking to the internet. And you also have this virtuous cycle between error reporting, which is being able to see from the field, is my device misbehaving? Is it stable? Is it under attack? And renewable security that allows you to respond to those types of error reports, to push out an update, to patch a device, and make sure that you can fix those problems as they're discovered. So these seven properties, the white paper is still out there, ak.ms slash seven properties, go read it. And it talks about that, that if you're going to connect a device to the internet, make sure that they have all these properties available or you're exposing yourself to a lot more risk. That, that's interesting what you just said, which is um, like when you consider con con connecting your device to the internet, right? The, the, these microcontrollers that are out there, they've been, they've been out there for a long time, not connected. Like they're controlling our life today. You have like many in your car, you have many in your house, you have many yeah. in your enterprise and, and around you. But yeah. today, most of them are not connected. Uh, but That's right. That industrial revolution, actually, we have more, more and more of them connected. However, you know, and, and, you know, maybe you have some notion of the proportions of how many of them are expected. But in general, um, I'm wondering, so these were were secure to a certain extent based on the fact that they were not connected to the internet. Uh, but do we need to have all of that and all of these various you know, areas of security for devices? Isn't that a bit overkill yeah. for all these MCU yeah. devices? Yeah, it's a really good question. Uh, you know, we talk about these MCUs, billions and billions of MCUs are sold around the world every year that aren't connected. They're really uh, the fabric of computing around you that you never see. And you know, there's a very common question that says, look, I get Azure Sphere, it's really powerful, it's protecting me, but don't I just need that for a traffic light or for some other instance where we're worried about a hacker causing havoc where someone could get hurt? And I think what I'd like to do, if it's okay with you, is let's talk about the least safety critical device on earth. What I'd like to talk about is a cactus watering sensor, right? You could say, here's the here's the best example of something that probably doesn't need Azure Sphere. Why do I need a cactus, you know, Azure Sphere and a cactus watering sensor, right? What does it yeah. do? Yeah. yeah, it can and protect this... you from the cactus, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is that cactus gonna gonna wake up overnight and crawl out of its pot? Um, uh, and you know, you look at this cactus watering sensor, and in this hypothetical cactus watering sensor, it only does one thing: it measures the amount of uh, water in the soil. It sends a message up through, let's say, Azure IoT and says, hey, the soil is dry, please come water me. It doesn't even turn on water automatically. And you say, what could a hacker do here? Well, if the cactus watering sensor is hacked, maybe the attacker could uh, stop you from sending the please water me message, right? You don't get it. Okay, well, it's a cactus, right? That's probably gonna be okay for quite a while. Or it starts sending you lots of watery messages and you just walk over to your cactus and you say, you know what, this looks pretty wet. I don't think you need to water it. What's, what's, you know, what's the harm here? And uh, when we talk about something like this, there's a really key learning that it's not just the function in this example, scale is what matters too. And I wanna go forward here and just remind everybody about the Mirai botnet. Mm -hmm. The Mirai botnet was a Deny, distributed denial service attack, which means there are lots of devices that got hacked all at once. These were uh, security cameras, but only about 100,000 of them. And that distributed denial service attack brought down a portion of the internet and caused tremendous economic damage. Now, what does this tell us? These were cameras, right? These weren't general purpose computers. They didn't necessarily have to be connected. What it tells us is if we go back to this watering sensor, if the person who manufactured this is at all successful, right? If they sell 100,000 of them, well, that means that it's a target for a hacker. And if there's a vulnerability, it means they could, they could break into these sensors, put them all together as a botnet, and actually launch an attack against a business or endpoint and really cause a lot of damage here, right? So um, the lesson here, I love that you brought up the fact, you know, that there are these billions of MCU devices, a very small number of them are connected right now. But pre-IoT, all these devices were what I think of as fire and forget. Your microwave, your alarm clock before you had a phone. These devices, someone wrote some software for them. They did one thing. And because they weren't connected to the internet, they never did anything else, right? And that was, that was okay. Security wasn't as important. But once you connect a device to the internet, that means that that fire and forget device, that single use device, can become a general purpose computer. 
And if it becomes a general purpose computer, which means any software can run on it, it can be weaponized by an attacker. And that means that it could be turned into a botnet and it could participate in a distributed denial of service attack and it can start causing a lot of harm uh, out, in the, out in the wide internet. So, so even the cactus sensor, right, needs the seven properties. And we think you should use Azure Sphere, but you know, it should have the seven properties, right, to protect that device. And so, like Ashley just said, that I was about to ask you. Uh, so, what is actually in Azure Sphere? How would Azure Sphere tackle such a botnet type of threat? Yeah, let's let's take just one example. I know there there are a bunch of other. Uh, if you'd like to go deeper, there's some other videos from Channel Nine that have uh, folks from Azure Sphere, uh, Jewel C, and Katie McCaffrey uh, recently to talk more about uh, the details of how different portions of our product work. But I just want to take one example. And, this, and how does Azure Sphere protect against a botnet? So if we look here at botnet defense, uh, a term you hear a lot in computing is a networking firewall. And uh, the networking firewall, what's its job? Well, you can put in some allowed places to contact, some allowed internet addresses. And then if you're not in that list, that's called a whitelist, then people who are connecting to you who aren't in the list get denied. And if an application tries to connect outside of that list, it can't, it can't connect. So the firewall is a way of preventing hackers and attackers from trying to test the security of your device by blocking connectivity before it happens. So how does Azure Sphere do this? Um, it's a little bit different. It's a little bit uh, stronger than what you typically see. And the reason for this is that in a typical device, you have what's called a runtime firewall, right? You configure your firewall, an application might configure it, you commit it, and, and it, it, it updates the firewall. Azure Sphere has what we call a compile time firewall. What I mean by that is that when the application developer makes their application, they have to know where that application is allowed to connect. So I've got an example here. Uh, there's an application manifest that, that every Azure Sphere uh, application developer needs to fill out, which basically describes when the application is developed, what resources is it. And those resources might be resources on the chip, like I need to talk to an I squared C peripheral, or those resources might be off the device. So in this little example I've got, there are four website addresses that we're allowing this application to connect to, but no others. And when the device is compiled and then run, those four websites are the only outgoing connection that this device is going to be allowed and no incoming connections are allowed. So you might say, well, how does this help with a botnet. Uh, what happens here when a botnet ends up finding a compromise? Well, for example, the Mirai botnet, what ended up happening is that uh, an application was compromised and then some malware was downloaded that ran out of memory. And typically what's common in a botnet is the first thing that that software does when it, when it runs is it calls home. It calls home to what's called a command and control server or a CNC server. And that's a web address, right? And then it says, ask for instructions. It says, what do I do? And then the person running the botnet can say, ah, go attack this website. Go to this, you know, go to this other place and download more software. Update yourself. There's a whole sophisticated set of machinery. And what this, what this firewall protects against is that when an application is compromised, that the, if, the, if some malware starts to run this part of a botnet, when it tries to connect, it's not going to be allowed to because it wasn't in this original firewall. It can't reconfigure the firewall because that firewall is outside of the application's control. It was set up when the application was compiled, not when it was run. And by taking advantage of that feature, we can really limit the damage um, an application vulnerability can have by limiting its outgoing connections. It's one of our best defenses against a botnet, as long as a vulnerability hasn't escaped the application uh, sandbox that we've, we've contained for it. Well, thanks, Ed. That's definitely a nice uh, insight into one of the many layers that Azure Sphere offers for protecting uh, Azure Sphere devices. And we're going to have other episodes that will deep dive into these different layers. Uh, and Ed, well, thanks again for joining the IF show today. Yeah, thank you. It's been a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's good to talk to you. Yeah. So um, if you want to get started with uh, Azure Sphere, learn more, you can go to aka.ms slash IoT show slash Azure Sphere. And Ed, well, there's plenty of resources for developers, right? Absolutely. In fact, dev kits, you can grab one today, order it, and start coding and building your own secured IoT device. Yeah, go get it. 
Awesome. Well, you know what you have to do? Um, well, go get your Azure Sphere kit. Go start coding for it. Don't forget to subscribe to the IH Show for the next episodes. Ed, thanks a lot for joining. Everyone, thanks a lot for watching today. Yeah, thanks, everybody, and stay safe.